There is nothing here that was created without the touch of the Logos. And that touch means that everything here isn't okay. Everything here isn't manageable. Everything has the potential to be very good. And whereas the mechanical universe, what we're always looking for is something better, right? We can improve this. Um, in the sacramental universe, okay, maybe there is progress. Of course, we are going to heaven when we die. There's a sense of a journey. But there's also a sense that everything I need is right here, right now. Not everything I want. That's a whole other question. That gets into ethics. <laughs> but everything I need is right here, right now. What do you want to say about this? This is a tricky topic, so the more we say, the better. Uh, well, I could say one thing. Yeah. I'll come in front of the camera. Yeah. Hey, uh, just to add to this, we probably had talked about it on Sunday, son, but uh, there's a gentleman, he was an Orthodox theologian named Alexander Schmemann, and he had a beautiful little book called For the Life of the World, which was all about the Eucharist. But he said, essentially, he said, when you get up on Sunday mornings, you've already entered into the Eucharistic movement. You're moving toward this great encounter with Christ in the bread and the wine. And then, when we leave church, we are the Eucharistic people. So we ourselves are being poured out the life of the world. So he says what happens sometimes is the church gets everything backwards and thinks the mysteries that happen within the service are the most important thing. But he said actually the most important thing is when we leave here as the Eucharistic people and we go out and we bring God's blessing to the world. And that way of thinking would change our understanding of the mission, our understanding of the church, uh, our understanding of our presence because ultimately it's our presence. You know, it's not... He, he uses us in all sorts of ways. Sometimes uh, people preaching or sharing, but many times our presence, just being in a place and praying for people, which we can do anyway, even on the job. So I, I, I might add just that one little yeah. detail. So is there a... It, it seems contrasting to think of that and all of what you said to the more recent um, and I'll use the word evangelical but idea of um, rapture there's nothing good about this world mm. and our only goal is to leave it right you know uh, I grew up with sure. now my, the church I grew up in actually had a quite a tension um, there weren't it, it was not a pre-millennial church like a lot are but you know as uh, the years went on the pastors that would come started to be more so that but uh, so anyway it just seems quite contrasting to to think of these two ways of looking at things yeah they couldn't be more different really first of all since we've grown up in this area let me be clear the rapture is based on two verses that i would argue are taken wildly out of context I would argue that. I'll just nail my position to the fence. Uh, and it's a doctrine that seems old to us, right? You grew up here in it. I grew up here in it. It's not an old doctrine. It's about 200 years old. And in the life of the church, that's a baby doctrine. Yeah. Um, this I, but what, what concerns me about it most is exactly what Eric hit. And that is, if we need rescue from this world, it says something about this world. It's not a good world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that's the problem, isn't it? I, there are problems in the world. There are problems in my marriage. <laughs> but is my marriage a good marriage? I think so. But do we does that mean everything is stress free? No. It's it's a dualistic form of thinking that has a lot to do with some very early heresies in the church, and I think it's singularly unhelpful. So yes, you're absolutely right. It could not be more different than the doctrine of the rapture. It's an antithesis to it. And it seems to push more for let's burn it all down than <laughs> let's work for its redemption. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, and that's where the Middle Ages, or the so-called Dark Ages, are misunderstood. You may have heard it this way, popular definition of the Dark Ages. Everything got so bad that the monks hid themselves in monasteries to get away from that sinful world. No, 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 no. Everything did get really bad. But they hid themselves away to preserve the knowledge and to teach people. So that when things settled down, they could rebuild. In other words, what had gone before, the earlier church, ancient Greece and Rome, they hadn't come to their end, but they needed to be preserved through this temporary rough time. And that's a very different thing than burn it all down. It's like, okay, it's a rough time, but we're going to have to rebuild. The day is going to come, we're going to have to rebuild. So let's save. I think one of the places we are in the life of the church right now, it's yet to be revealed. But I believe one of the places we are in the church is we've got to be about conserving again. Conserving the truth. Conserving what we know. Because we seem to be going through one of those temporary fluctuations where society is struggling. Well, we can't condemn them. One reason we can't condemn them is God doesn't give us that choice. But the second reason we can't condemn them is we are them. It's not with them and us. We're all just us. So we have to preserve and wait for them to come to their senses. So that we can share again. Amen. I mean, one of the first things I learned in a marriage is when, when Kate's already mad at me is not the time to try and have the conversation about the disagreement. <laughs> That's very good. Wait until she's calm. <laughs> well, society's kind of mad at us right now. Well, they don't need to be burned down any more than I would end my marriage. But we may be in a time where we're trying to preserve the treasure of the past until such time as society realizes that we have something to say. That's good. One last thing I want to say, and then we, well, we'll see questions here. Uh, well, if everything is sacramental, then why do these matter? It's one of the areas where we can drift too far in the other direction <laughs> if we're not careful is if everything has the potential to be sacramental, why do the gospel sacraments and the other seven, five things generally called sacraments, the sacramentals, why do they matter if everything can be sacramental? Because this is the guy who says, well, I don't need to go to church. I can worship just as well on a mountain. I can go to the lake and worship God, which you can. But if everything is sacramental, what do we say to him? We can say a lot of things, but specifically about the sacraments. I would say you're not being fed. You're not, you're not receiving the, the cup. And sure, the, and there you go. Because yeah. here's the interesting thing. In a sacramental worldview, I said a bird song can be sacramental. <clears throat> here's the challenge with a bird song. What percentage of time is a bird song sacramental? Let's try and quantify it. <laughs> Isn't that based on opinion? I mean, some, some could say 100% of the time. Some could yeah. say 1%. It's based on the movement of the Spirit, right? Yeah. And it's not, it might be sacramental to you and not to me. Right. The bread and the wine, after we have consecrated, after we've prayed over them, what percentage of the time are they sacramental? All the time, 100%. 100%. So if you want a sure and certain place to meet God, it's here. He has bound himself by his own presence, his own promise to be here. That leads me to a question as to our church takes communion and receives the body and blood every week. Right. What about those churches that only do it on special occasions? Yeah. Generally, this is, this is a, I, I hate saying generally because it means I'm doing a, an injustice to a, right. an opinion. Generally, churches who have a different view of either what communion is for mm -hmm. or a lower view of communion, that they don't even think Jesus is in, right. will do it less often. Mm -hmm. Now, that's generally. Um, there are also some churches, I think of Lutherans a couple of generations ago, they thought it was so special that you shouldn't do it. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it was too holy. Um, so generally, the um, the higher the view, 
and the availability of clergy, uh, the more you'll do it. But again, that's a very broad generalization. Very broad. Uh, but, see, one of the problems I always had as I thought through this as a young Christian was um, I had lived largely as a worldly man. I had a little sense of the sacramental in the world because I was kind of a wild-eyed uh, optimist. But what I was looking for as I came to faith was, well, where can I find God? And as I dug at it more, I realized that the question was, where can I find God consistently? Not, not occasionally, because I can find God in the mouth. Sure, if he wills. But where can I find God consistently? And the answer is, I can find him where he promised he would be. And there are three places he promised he'd be. In the sacraments, in the preaching of the word, and in the community of his people. Where two or three are gathered, I will be in the midst of it. So I began looking for the will words. Where did he promise me I could meet him? Because sometimes... Hearing the cicadas and seeing the lightning bugs makes me really, I, I get confused with God. Sometimes it doesn't get the job done. So I go to where he promised he would be. And that's one of the challenges in all this uh, new digital technology. You can hear a great Christian lecture on a video. You can listen to a great Christian teaching on a podcast. But that's not where he promised he'd be. Part of the sacramental worldview again, we've got to deal with the matter, right? i got to get myself here. Not because it'll mean God loves me more. He loves me totally. But because it's good for me. This is where he will be. He will meet me here. I don't have to wonder if today will be the day that I look at that uh, little uh, cardinal on the lawn and, and get transported <laughs> Uh, maybe today. No, it's just a <laughs> uh, That's good. Uh, but here, he will always be. And that's the key about the sacraments. It's the avenue God made. Sacraments are never something we do for God. It's always something God does for us. Always something God does for us. <clears throat> Questions? Concerns? <laughs> Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, let's we'll we'll finish up with baptism and communion specifically next next time. So keep working on those. Look for the questions.